DePaul University. And also I'm the director, I'm you know, happy to be right now the director of the Women's Center. And most of my work is um, within the context of prison abolition and transformative justice and uh, feminist and queer anti-violence work. So that's kind of where an anti, anti-racist anti work, um, you know, interpersonal, uh, institutional and state uh, levels. And so that's who I am. So welcome. And I'll turn it over to Amalia. Thank you, Anne, for that wonderful introduction. My name is Amalia Salmaron. I use she, her pronouns. And I am a BAMA student in my second year in the WGS department. Um, I'm also the Building Communities Ending Violence graduate assistant. Um, and I hold a couple other titles. I work at the Women's Center. Um, and yeah, to just build off of what Anne said, I think central to this um, this year has been this barrier of how do we cultivate community without physical proximity, which is so elemental to the process and can often make it a lot easier. Um, but I'm very proud to say that we found a lot of different ways to really bridge those gaps and facilitate um, open, honest, willing, and caring conversations and relationships. So I'll turn it back to Anne so we can get started. Okay. Thank you, Amalia. And um, Grace, could I be a uh, co-host so I can share the screen just, just for a second? So uh, I'm going to start with um, kind of thinking about um, a kind of key um, phrase of our approach, not phrase, but um, I don't know, affirmation um, that kind of centers us and grounds us in the Women's Center. And um, it's we all belong here. We will defend each other. So really quickly, I'm going to share this screen. Um, can you all see that? So this is um, this is artwork by Micah Besant, and she created this in the context of right after Trump was elected, and it was kind of really out there in terms of the the ban on Muslim, um, you know, across the um, across the the country, the ban on Muslim people coming into the country, the, um, the racism, the um, sexism and misogyny and sexual violence and, you know, uh, anti-immigration, like all those areas that Trump just came in on. And so she created this for a group of youth that was protesting and out in the streets saying no. And so I thought this sentiment was so powerful. We all belong here and we will defend each other. And I think it's, um, it's such a powerful image and also a powerful call to what the kind of work we might do within the Women's Center. And for me, within Women's and Gender Studies. Um, and it's a recognition that that we is um, not homogeneous, that it's heterogeneous, that the we has to be built, it can't be assumed or, you know, um, and so, we try in the Women's Center to stretch ourselves all the time to think about who could inhabit that we and to see how, what are the skills we need? What are the values we need to be able to build that? Because we believe that that's really necessary to, um, to coalition, solidarity, and really um, being as um, Jackie Alexander, who's an amazing black feminist writes, to be, to be in each other's battles you know, across these divides and differences to see ourselves as um, there for one another in these times of, um, of attack and crisis. And so, um, so yeah, I just wanted to open with that. And, the, and within that, we have a whole set of values of how we try to practice it, accountability, listening, you know, understanding, um, care, you know, all those ways that it would be necessary in order to, to build that we. So now I'm gonna turn it back over to Amalia. I also would just like to build off of that for one second. I think the Women's Center and WGS is a really particular um, facet of the institution, like the, the college and academic institution, um, where we're so often pushing against um, like capitalism, neoliberalism, all of these components that make up DePaul. And so try, constantly trying to figure out like, how can we facilitate um, caring spaces that can be inclusive um, in the ways that academia sometimes is not. And so I think that our values and 
the physical space is a huge component of that, but um, I feel like we've been able to do that. And that kind of leads me into my segue of our overarching theme um, for the Women's Center, but also for Building Communities Ending Violence, the program that I am sort of leading, um, which is Another World is Possible. So this is from Adrienne Marie Brown's um, book, I believe it's Emergent Strategy, but she really calls us to think um, more specifically about creative ways to envision a world where community is at our center, where we can really embody abolition, where we can really envision ourselves um, with genuine care and open communication. And we've really tried to embody that in all of the events, all of the spaces that we've opened up, um, whether that be through circles, through um, community events that we're hosting online, whether that be um, through some major projects pushing against white supremacy um, and trying to create inclusive conversations um, around gender, sexuality, et cetera. Um, but it's really a call for each of us to dig within ourselves and um, find what it is we can envision and put that into practice. So with that, I'll invite everyone to take a couple of moments, if you're feeling so inclined, to drop in the chat um, what comes to mind when you hear the phrase, another world is possible? What are the first things that are in your heart that you could share with us? Oh, perfect. Thank you for those um, citations. I think for me, the biggest thing that comes to mind is, is finding ways to cultivate um, active care and open communication that's willing, vulnerable, and, and holds change at its center. Yes, thank you for, thank you for these. I completely agree. So while folks are continuing to do that, I'm gonna go ahead and transition to some of the projects that I've been responsible for or have helped co-create and co-facilitate. I'm really excited about a lot of them. And so I'll just start with, um, the first, which is um, healing practices. So I come from a background um, in the College of Science and Health. I was a psychology major. And so really integral to my understanding of trauma um, and, and cultivating healing is this connection between the mind and the body. So mindfulness comes to mind, but also just movement, um, ways to move communally, um, ways to really, um, develop that connection, that reconnection and slow down um, from the world and allow ourselves some space. So with that, I created healing practices. Um, it met every month, basically for the whole quarter. And I, we basically go around, we see what people need and I connect folks to some resources. Um, we do everything from journaling to um, creating safe spaces to healing holds. Um, and it's a really beautiful, beautiful space. Um, we've also created a couple of mind and body connective pieces in the Women's Center. We have a self-care space, et cetera, et cetera. But really taking all of the elements of the Women's Center and trying to re-embody them online. So if that means starting every session by suggesting folks do what they need, maybe make a cup of tea or grab a blanket so that we can really be present and, and feel safe with one another. Um, from there, we have to kind of bridge that um, one of the elemental pieces of building communities ending violence is um, dandelions in the concrete. And so typically that is an in person event that's amazing and beautiful and so warm and welcoming. And so the transition to put that online um, was a little difficult at first, but I felt I feel like we got the hang of it. Um, so the first two dandelions were a series of sessions. Um, the typical components are 
uh, a hands-on, interactive, communal, conversational um, element where we can just be together and create together and, and really feel the warmth of what it feels like to be in community. And then the second um, part of Dandelions would be a sharing session. So we typically have an open mic where folks can share their artwork, their stories, their experiences, um, songs, poems, anything they would like to. So we really try to re-embody those those ideas and those core um, elements of dandelions onto this virtual platform. So we've broken it up into traditionally three sessions. So we'll do a creative session and then a movement session. Um, typically either students or faculty will lead us in a stretch um, or like yoga period or meditative period. And then we've tried to incorporate some elements of um, spoken word where folks can submit pieces and we can we can distribute them. And we've done that in a variety of ways and we'll talk about some others in just a little bit. Um, but yes, and so in connection to that, we were able to uplift the iconic and revolutionary, um, this bridge called my back, the anthology, this bridge called my back. It was written in 1981. So we were celebrating the 40 year anniversary and I got to be um, a part of both of the events in connection to that we had a, um, basically an open mic, a curated open mic where folks got to submit pieces about how the um, book related to their life has changed their life, has, has kind of been foundational to their feminism and their coalitional practices. Um, and then we also got to invite a couple of the, the co-authors to come and speak about their experiences. So amidst that, finding various ways to cultivate connection to open conversation and to really ground ourselves although we are isolated physically isolated finding ways to bridge those connections um, over virtual spaces and with that said we've also i've also tried to create a lot of open dialogue around how to create more intentional um, conversations relationships um, and relationships around accountability, around intervention and around healing. Um, and so over the year I've offered, Anne and I have offered um, a variety of like pop-up workshops, whether that be about pod mapping, um, which is a skill developed by the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective and Mia Mingus specifically, um, that describes how to really think intentionally about the relationships that you do have and folks that you can go to for direct support. Um, and if there are few, which there probably are for most of us, if we really sit and think about it, um, how is it then that we can create more dialogue and create more intentionality within the relationships that we do have um, so that we can have that support and so that we can be developing um, more conversations, opening up information and, and be willing to support one another. So whether it be that, um, we had a workshop that was um, centering navigating difficult conversations in the time of COVID. And the, the very initial one was around racism. And so um, just coming in with some issues or, or com examples of situations in which you needed a little more guidance or you were really wondering like, how do I approach this? How can I tell this person that what they're saying is harmful um, in a way that maybe they'll be open and receptive? And of course, leading up with the underlying assumption that there are no direct answers, right? But when we're in community with one another, um, we can share collective wisdom and we can, we can offer support um, in ways and maybe even bridge folks to new ideas or ways to approach things that they might not have thought of before. So that was a lot of my work through BCEV. Um, I'm sure that there are other things that I that are kind of probably skipping my mind. So I'm sorry about that. And I might mention them a little bit later, but um, I would say that the focus was really grounding ourselves in intentionality this year and, and really bringing willingness, a willingness to be not wrong, but just be maybe uncomfortable or curious um, so that we can build off of that together. So with that, I will transition over to Anne. Okay, thank you, Amalia. Yeah, I think that um, one of our one of our commitments is try to is to try to build community for movement, for social movements, for change. And so how do we expand um, who's involved? How do we expand our own understandings of issues? and contexts that we may not be familiar with. 
So how are we, and how are we deepening our relationships? So I think, um, I think our, our, our idea is always about moving toward change or moving toward uh, mobilization toward change or you know, building toward that. So one of the projects that I'm gonna share is a project I did uh, that the Women's Center did with the Office of Multicultural Student Success at DePaul and specifically Eva Long, who was the then, she's no longer at DePaul, but she was the coordinator of that Asian Pacific Islander DESI Student Resource Center. And uh, I was working with the other identity-based centers, the, um, the LGBTQIA Center, the um, Black Student Center, Cultural Center, and the Latinx Center. And the idea was that we would create a project called Challenging Project 100, 100 Days of Challenging White Supremacy. We started the project in 2019. Our vision was to have 100 days during the uh, winter and spring quarter um, of 2020 to every day we would post something on Instagram um, you know, for each of the 100 days. And we invited students, staff, and faculty from across, um, you know, who are students, faculty, and staff to contribute from multiple identities, multiple perspectives, multiple vantage points as a way of trying to um, cultivate um, a conversation, cultivate many conversations within the university about the, the, um, the expansiveness of white supremacy and also the multiple ways of intervening within it. White supremacy meaning not uh, only these extremists, but thinking of white supremacy as a, as a, as a historical system that produces racism. And so, um, I mean, it was, it's an amazing project. I, I, um, I don't know, Grace, if you have access to the link tree on the Women's Center website. Um, I'm having trouble with my own computer. There you go. If yeah, you I'll, pull it, I'll pull it up right now. That's just the Facebook like little tutorial that you guys have on there, but I'll pull up the link tree too. Yeah, the link would be better, but um, thank you so much, Grace. I should have had that up already. But anyway, um, it's kind of an amazing project because there are so many different voices and perspectives, all challenging white supremacy from these different vantage points. And, um, and then of course, our whole plan was to have these different workshops and opening up spaces, different departments had signed on, but then COVID happened. And so things shut down. Um, and so we kept on with the project. And then this year, uh, thanks to Belinda Andrade, I'm sorry, I didn't mention, Belinda Andrade was like the central visionary for this project. She really um, developed the Instagram, you know, the way we were doing Instagram and um, developed the posts once they were submitted and just has been a key leader. And so one of the things she did this year was invite some of the contributors to do live Instagrams where they would talk about their post. They would talk about, you know, why they did it the way they did it, what they were hoping to get out of it, and then generate a conversation for whoever was on Instagram right then and participating in it. Really beautiful. So I want to give amazing, you know, um, Gratitude for Belinda Andrade, who is a um, who's a student at DePaul in uh, in um, publicity and advertising, and uh, yeah, just a, a an amazing force. Um, so that was, I think that was a great project, and that's a project we'll continue to come back to and find ways to use. So um, yeah, so I'll turn it back to Amalia. Thank you. Yeah, Project 100 has been incredible. Um, I also submitted a submission and um, I would say that the connective piece of doing the Instagram lives with folks who have submitted so that they can expand on their submission, they can expand on what led them to create said submission, et cetera, has been a really connective piece. And Belinda has been amazing in, um, her development of social media, because in the time of COVID, that has been our literal glue that has held us together. Um, and she has really put in so much time and effort um, into creating such a beautiful Instagram and Facebook. And so, yeah, just really wanting to uplift her for a moment um, before I transition to the WGS graduate colloquium. So that is another position that I have held. Um, so essentially the colloquium is a student um, 
organization that, well, I guess it's less of an organization and more of just a committee where students get to um, present ideas, whether that be a research for professional development, for more um, pedagogical um, conversation or community development in which they then get to plan events and um, either bring folks in that are not at the school, um, whose, whose research they're interested in or work that they're interested in, or um, kind of the best piece of this is that we get to be connected to other departments. Um, so for example, last year when we were more in person, we were able to connect um, with several other departments to bring in some um, Dr. Julie Moody Freeman um, and her work um, and really just expand our networking pool so that we can open dialogue and begin to either work together or support one another in either process. Um, and also just um, introduce each other to like more opportunities. So, um, this past year has been remarkable. We were able to put on some really incredible events um, that really situated themselves in the time of COVID. So A, they were really necessary, not only because um, it's really important to see the work that people are doing amid the crisis, but something that I think COVID was able to do was break open um, and shed a huge light for a lot of people on the systemic oppression that exists. And so it was, it was a really great opportunity for um, feminism, women's studies, us at the Women's Center to kind of showcase um, what like what oppression is, what it looks like and how it's directly impacting people in a way that is contribute, contributing to all of us at once. It's something that we can't look away from. So one of the examples of, of one of the events we were able to put on was um, a discussion of reproduct, reproductive justice in the time of COVID, what it's looked like, um, we had folks that were doulas, that were midwives, um, some that, and, and a discussion of A, how they got to where they are, um, and then B, how they've been able to um, help folks situated in this moment. Um, it, we had a panel, I think, of three or four amazing people um, that were also just like so real and genuine and um, it opened up a conversation around reproductive justice that we have not had this past year in the department and it really situated it in a in this immediate time of crisis um and i i'm remembering that folks were leaving with that event with so many additional questions with so many thought-provoking um discussions and have are starting to build off of it in the future and that's really the the hope of the colloquium um, so not only do we bring in folks um one of the biggest things i think that our department um, and just students in general didn't get a real chance to um, do is get to meet their faculty. So typically you kind of go to your department's um, floor. Our, our department's floor is floor five and you kind of walk around, everyone's doors open, you can pop in, check in. So what we tried to do this year through the colloquium is kind of open more conversations just for students and faculty, um, whether that be WGS faculty, faculty outside of the department. So we could understand what folks are doing um, and how to build more relationships. Um, so every year, I, I think now um, I was able to create a staple colloquium event that's going to invite our WGS faculty to share what research they're doing, either how they got to WGS, um, what, what sparked their real interest in feminism, which is just that it's our lives, um, or like what research they're currently doing, what help they need so that folks can um, get connected. Um, yeah, and then also during through the WGS colloquium, we've been able to do a lot of workshopping. So one of the goals is professional development, um, but to us, that means how do we enter a classroom and be able to actually have these more difficult conversations that are impacting so many different folks in different ways, because we're not talking about numbers necessarily, one plus one equals two, we're talking about people's real situations. And so how do we develop coalitions in the classroom that can kind of carry us as we're talking about these more difficult things? Um, and so we've opened up a couple of spaces to discuss A, the, the skills and tools and background that faculty are bringing in and what they're kind of trying to assert in the classroom, and then B, what students are wanting what students say that they need, what students are like, I have no idea, but I'm here to figure it out. And being able to bridge that, um, 
this gap between like teacher and student, because in a classroom, I, I believe that everyone in the WGS department embodies the sentiment of we are all teachers and we are all learning from one another, particularly when folks are coming in with direct experiences that are related to this reading of theory or this experience that we're going to be, you know, contextualizing and et cetera. So we, I've really tried to make it a focus in the colloquium to um, close that gap and create more conversations. So um, I'm really hoping that that will continue. Um, we've been able to do that some over COVID, um, but I think that the one thing as well that we've learned from, from holding these virtual spaces is that they become a little more convenient um, for folks. Sometimes it's a lot to just sit at a computer and talk about really um, difficult or heavy things all day, but I think um, it also creates a lot more flexibility for people to have these conversations and to feel like maybe sometimes in person you feel like you have to talk all the time and and here you can kind of listen and offer in the chat and so there are there have been a lot of really great um community building elements that that maybe we wouldn't have thought of um as we transitioned online so with that we have a couple other things that i'd love Anne to start us off with okay well one of the things is as molly amalia mentioned is that classroom spaces can be really difficult whether or not they're online because People are coming in with different experiences, different identities, different relationships to these systems of power, and some are more, much more deeply impacted than others. So how do you create a space that recognizes that or names that or, you know, creates a space that you're not creating more harm? Um, because that easily happens in a classroom space when, um, when people are coming from those different experiences and vantage points and have different kinds of information. And so one of the questions is always like, how do you, how do you address harm? Or how do you address, how do you address a situation that doesn't deepen the harm? And one practice that we use in the Women's Center a lot um, are circles. And circles are one way of um, their um, circle practices. The ones that we're using um, come from, um, the um, Tinglet people out of the Upper Yukon, and they were shared with us. They were shared originally with me through an organization in Chicago called the Community Justice for Youth in Institute. And I think that, um, and anyway, and then it's been adapted. And I've also been part of circles for years through fe feminist, you know, feminists often gather in circles. Um, but the specific practice is really allowing a space so that every single person in the space is invited to contribute to the conversation. And so that's been really powerful that we've actually been able to create circles online where everyone has an opportunity to speak from their own experience, from their understanding, even their understanding if you're talking about readings, you know, like so that you are able to really um, kind of um, become more aware. Everybody comes up more aware of our, the differences, not just the similarities, which is something that we really carried from this bridge called My Back, writings by radical women of color. How do we develop movements that really recognize the differences between us and also the divisions that are dividing us and being able to name and address those. Um, and this year we felt in per particularly though, that we've needed to create circles of support and care giving ongoing crises. So um, one of the, so we have a weekly check-in circle that we have uh, through the Women's Center that Haley Curtis runs. It's a beautiful circle every week, just a check-in circle, come in, what's going on? That's been a really powerful space um, for people who are navigating whatever's going on at the university, but also people who have lost people during COVID, people who are, navigating police violence and um, and um, police hostilities in the in the city people who are um, whatever they're coming in with you know navigating um, you know their classrooms um, so that's one powerful space and the other space that uh, we created um, that Haley Curtis along with Shalyn Beasley who's also a WGS major um, and Haley actually is a graduate student in forced migration and um, refugee studies. They created a circle for black indigenous and people of color around creating a, a collective grieving space given everything that's uh, happened this year. And so that's been something we've created this year again as a way to, to build support with a, recogni a deep recognition of um, what people may need 
and also um, trying to build um, spaces that feel um, safer for people or feel more comfortable or uh, where people um, don't have don't have to worry as much about uh, about harm. So again, those are sometimes hard to create, but these are two ways we've done that. And then Amalia and Nina Wilson, um, I'll let Amalia introduce that one. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so myself and my coworker, colleague, friend, amazing person, Nina Wilson, have created a um, sexual assault support circle space. Um, and it's been really beautiful. Um, I was kind of weary of how exactly we would be able to create a space that would elicit, elicit such vulnerability um, over Zoom, but it has been really remarkable um, how we've been able to do that. And we wanted to create this space um, because we, we were starting to recognize as a survivor myself how how the isolation was really impacting um, my process, like how I was um, not only able to re-embody myself, but also connect with others, really be focused. Um, and so just extended that to our community and um, a lot of other folks were feeling the same way. So it's been a really beautiful and um, caring environment. So very grateful to do that. And that all of the circles, I would say, are maybe apart from the grieving and loss, are extended to folks in the DePaul community, like whether they're ex-students, ex-faculty, staff, anybody. Um, yeah, so that has been really, really incredible. Thank you, Amalia. So I think we're just gonna open it up. I mean, I th think we saw ourselves as trying to offer some of the things that we've been trying to do this year um, and, um, but we also, yeah, if you have questions or you wanna share some of what you're doing or your thoughts about uh, whatever we've shared, we'd love to hear from you. If we could start, maybe I put a question in the chat asking, you guys are talking about so many amazing initiatives that the Women and Gender Studies Department has and the Women's Center um, for students and the DePaul community. What are some of the initiatives that you can highlight that are broader to anyone coming in, trying to be a peacemaker, trying to be in the peace movement um, that wants to take inspiration from your work at the Women's Center? Okay, that's a great question. And I would say, and Amalia, you can jump in, but I, I mean, I think that um, most of our things are open. You know, so the events that we hold and the activities that we hold are, are open to the public. And so, um, you know, some of the support spaces, um, you know, um, are, are, we don't advertise them as broadly, but um, I guess I would say that we're open, you know, um, for the for the most part. Um, and so, yeah, they're open to the public and they're open to public conversations. Some of them, sometimes, you know, if something's really focused, like, you know, what's going on in the WGS department right now that we need to talk about in terms of pedagogy, you know, yeah. less, you know, but any of our events, anything we put on Instagram, those are open. The um, Project we 100, we invited alums to participate, um, you know, and some people who have relationships with us at DePaul who are not alums, you know, like um, people who used to work here or right. I don't know, people we're connected with will invite in also. So nothing we do uh, is exclusive. And we've also been involved in pro more direct projects that are directly uh, connected to community organizations. We have a really good relationship with Love and Protect that works with, um, um, in, you know, works to free incarcerated uh, survivors of violence. And um, I think, so that's an important uh, community connection. We've had longstanding relationships with Project NIA and other organizations in the city that are um, that work around abolition and restorative and transformative justice and um, you know other organizations around the, the city that are doing justice work. So I would like to just add that I think that has been one of the benefits of transitioning on to a virtual platform. Um, typically a lot of our events are held on campus. So that kind of restricts who's able to come um, to location and kind of just like 
maybe proximity, but with this online platform, we've been able to really expand. I know we got a couple of emails about folks at Rutgers who were like interested in the work that we were doing. And they were like, is it possible that we can share this? Yes, please come. Like, I, I completely agree and want to uplift what Anne said. Um, a lot of our, a lot of our um, core like events um, previously when we were in person, I think we're not restricted to DePaul, but it just happened to be that DePaul folks were coming. But now again, as we've transitioned, um, we've been able to open it up and it's been incredible because we get even more voices and more conversations. So yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Barry. Thank you, Grace. Yeah, I so enjoyed listening to both of you, Anne and Amalia. Um, yeah, I say uh, thank you to Grace for um, for uh, going over the breakout sessions and and having such a great description of this one uh, is what uh, sort of hit my spot. I guess I was telling her like what's really on my mind right now. It's kind of like intersectional allyship and intersectional healing, and uh, so I feel like both of you really spoke powerfully to. Um, you know, things connected with that. And maybe particularly, I, I, I'm really into embodiment practice. And so when Amalia is talking about sort of communal, uh, I guess she wasn't too specific, but it's, it was enough for me to say, yes, wow. And uh, I think I mentioned Resma Menikin in, in the chat. So I wrote this book, My Grandmother's Hands. Okay. And uh, it, he, he, the, the book, I mean, it's a theory of um, intergenerational trauma and healing in a way, or a theory is a narrative. But the important part in a way is, is the embodiment practices that are at the end of almost every chapter that uh, really key into this kind of thing. And Resma Menikin is amazing. He, um, he uh, lives in Minneapolis. He worked with the Minneapolis Police Department and uh, Police Chief Arredondo, or whatever his name is, uh, uh, you know, long before George Floyd uh, was lynched. Um, but yeah, so his practices, like, so his three main, his categories in that book are white bodies, blue bodies, and black bodies. And, and he, the, like one of the central metaphors, if you will, in that book is white body supremacy. It's a very viscerally mm -hmm. uh, sort of embodiment oriented. So, yeah. And then, so um, I wanted to share a little bit uh, my reaction in a way to, to the sort of cumulative effect of, of what you're saying. It's like this image of like a chain reaction. So a chain reaction, of course, we associate with like nuclear power and great destruction. So it's a different kind of chain reaction, so a morally redeemed chain reaction. And, you know, the, 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 it's like, like connection, you know, releases energy. And embodied connection can release a lot more energy. Sometimes that can be too much energy, right? It can be harmful. But like, what well, it feels like, well, you know, what you're trying to do there is, is to harmonize and and you know to so that that um, so there can be healing, and um, you know, and that I guess it's that uh, sort of keys into in, into like the the I guess what well, Amalia you, you said you you had a psychology background right so so as a whole the whole trauma narrative right? you know with so many writers um, yeah so yeah so trauma is you know, so like traumatic healing. Uh, so hopefully, you know, we can have this sustained chain reaction that, that, that heals and expands and saves the world. So good luck. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I told, I'm going to purchase this book. I'm very excited about it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's a, I, I won't, I've only started it, but it's, it, it seems like an amazing book. So Shelton, you also had a question. What supports do you make available to persons who are possibly re-traumatized through circle discussions and sharing? I think that um, the circles themselves, we, we carefully um, put together 
to, um, to decrease the possibility of re-traumatization in the way that we begin, you know, so it's a very, it's a very uh, thought out process, um, but definitely we make ourselves available and then would offer people resources um, because, you know, if somebody's, if, if somebody's struggling after a circle, well, I don't know, I know I have, and I'm sure Amalia has, and, and everybody that I know Haley does it, we'll meet with people after, we'll talk it through with them, find out what they need. Um, but part of the circle process itself, we also ask, what do people need? Like that's one of our moving toward the end discussions. And so that opens up the possibility of people asking. So thank you. That's always, that's important to, that's always at the center of my mind when I think, especially of doing uh, support circles. So thank you for that. Amalia, do you want to add, we have one minute. I know. Um, yeah, just quickly, I just wanted to uplift what Anne said about asking folks what they need. So um, that's one of the elemental pieces of circle keeping um, is making it a level um, experience so that when we go around, I had one experience where it was starting to get really, really heavy. And um, me and my co-facilitator, we just kind of looked at each other and we said, once it got back to our turn, we said, so we're feeling like it's really heavy right now. Um, what are folks needing? Can we just go around and, and check in? And we did that. And some folks said resources, some folks said just a breath, some folks said, you know, different things. And some folks said to stay after and to talk about stuff. Um, and so then we were able to offer, um, but it's really part of the process is inviting folks to um, key into whatever they're feeling so that we can address it as a group. So yeah, just wanting to uplift that. Um, and yeah, I think that we are actually coming towards the end of our time. Um, thank you so much to Grace, to all of you here and to Anne for inviting me. Um, this has been wonderful. And I hope that each of you are leaving with something. Oh gosh, sorry. I've have four like animals, um, <laughs> um, are leaving with a little more than what you came with and I'll turn it over to Anne. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I'll just echo uh, Amalia and thank Amalia for joining me, Grace for inviting us, each of you for joining us and stay in touch. Uh, I can put my email in um, if you wanna. We have a, an amazing, beautiful, incredible newsletter done by Nina Wilson, who's another um, student worker in the Women's Center. And I mean, it's beautiful every week resources and attending to care, attending to politics, attending to all of it. So um, I can put you on there if you send me your email address, I'll add you to it. Uh, so thank you so much, everyone. I'm sorry, I keep coming up with other things to say. So thank you very much. Appreciate each of you. Thank you. Uh, yes, take care. Thank you both so much. This was even though it was only 45 minutes, it was so informative and so powerful. Um, I put the link in the chat to go back to the main session. We will have closing remarks from some of our organizers before the day ends at noon. So don't leave, go to the main session, <laughs> um, please. Zoom is so weird. Usually we'd just be going back into another room, which we kind of are. <laughs> so going back into the main room, but thank you both so much. This was I think it's what we all needed right now during this time. So thank you very much. And I will see you all in the main room. Have a good rest of your day. Mm -hmm.